If Red Eye had any problem with me staying at 1020 Tower, he did nothing to show it. Even the loss of the Olicorn and Griffin seemed to go unnoticed. I knew that should worry me. Instead, I ignored it. Instead, I relaxed. I even went to the spa with homage. Twice. I didn't want to think of myself as a selfish pony, but fuck Red Eye. I needed this. And hadn't I earned at least a little of it? Maybe not, considering my mistakes. The damaged memory orb, the really stupid battle plans, going behind the wall alone. But if I didn't, then my companions certainly did. I had hoped Zenith and Homage would get along. But while Homage seemed to like the zebra, Zenith maintained a thankful but remote demeanor, even a touch frosty. It made the muffin baking session in the kitchen awkward enough that I spent the time in the library, sitting at the table, researching and reading. I had just finished a comparative reading of the library's unabridged version of Applied Gemstones with my own, and was starting up at the huge painting of Splendid Valley when Zenith tried it in. Any luck finding your daughter? I asked, trying to sound casual as I reminded her what an exceptional and unique tool Homage had put at the zebra's disposal. Yes and no, Zenith replied. I have seen signs of her tribe. They have been living in the foothills beneath the Canterlot ruins, she said quickly. Safely outside the cloud, but I have seen no signs of my daughter. Still, thank you for this. You should be thanking Homage. I have. Then, why do you act so... cold to her? The zebra contemplated me, judging me, and finally said, Did you not see the weapon she used? Your lover has been touched by the stars. She is cursed. No good can come of her. Zenith walked out. Well, fuck. It would seem that even now, there was no reasoning with the zebra when it came to that nonsense. I was probably lucky I didn't step on any star spawn blood, or she might think that I was cursed too. There's no such thing as curses, I called out after her in frustration. With a deep sigh, I buried my head into the scattered books. A few minutes later, Homage strode in, a puff of muffin batter on her nose. Now then, she whispered huskily as she wrapped her forelegs around me. I flushed, feeling a pleasant, uncontrolled fluttering wash over my body, like I'd fallen into a bed of butterflies. That fluttering collected at my nether regions, becoming a very warm and joyfully difficult to bear. Twenty-three, wasn't it? Oh my goddesses, she was actually counting. The Sky Bandit cut through the air as we approached Splendid Valley. The sky was crisp and slightly stained with smoke. The valley below was a rocky wasteland, completely barren of life. Scattering small holes were the only warning of the caves beneath the homes of dozens, if not hundreds, of the most dangerous monsters in all of Equestria. Hellhounds. I floated on binoculars and stared towards the horizon. A sinkhole several miles across indicated where a bellfire bomb had been detonated. The bomb had struck in underground and detonated. The surface above had collapsed with the toxin-filled tunnels below. Over the last 200 years, the sinkhole had weathered and eroded into a wide crater. It glowed faintly, even in the daylight, and it was marked with hundreds of holes. On the cusp of the crater, I saw the crumbling walls of the Mariponi. Once a station for gem mining, the building had more in common with Shattered Hoof than any of the Ministry hubs I'd seen. It could have passed for a fortress, but a devastated one. The explosions in Sinkhole had torn away part of the foundation and crumbled the rest. About a third of the building had collapsed into the crater. The rest had suffered a mega quake. Whoa, Nelly! If the goddess sur don't survive that, I reckon she'll probably earn 200 years of living. What is the plan, little one? 
Zenith asked. Plan? Velvet Remedy chuckled. I think Little Pip's just planning to go in there and shoot her. My friends all had spent the last couple days in much needed recovery, as had I. Despite the mounting hopelessness of our mission, everyone was well rested and back in form. If I was going to fail and die, I was happy it would be like this. With these ponies. No. Wait. Zebras weren't ponies. With these people. Well, then it's a darn good thing I sold all those guns and bought us plenty of ammo. Even managed to get some enchanted ones for little Macintosh. Don't know if they're enchanted with goddess slaying, but we can hope. I checked my pit buck and brought up my eyes forward sparkle. I checked the date and time. Ditsy Doo should be getting her muffins about now. I smiled to Zenith. Thanks for helping with that. I'm sure she'll love them. It struck me that when Zenith and I had walked across the moat and outside the wall, I had been in the equestrian wasteland for just over five weeks. Now it was nearly six. Six weeks from apprentice pitbuck technician to would-be deity slayer. My life is surreal. Velvet Remedy leaned close. So, how high did you get to? I blushed hotly and buried my face in my forearms. Look sharp, Calamity called out. Incoming at high eight. My head shot up. I pulled out the binoculars again. Five glowing orbs, all the shields, were heading towards us from Maripony. Damn it. I should have worn the damn Enclave gear after all. Calamity cursed. Lil Pip, reassemble Spitfire's Thunder. We're in for a bumpy ride. I levitated the magically augmented anti-machine rifle from Calamity's holster and began putting it together. Four midnight blue alicorns suddenly appeared, flanking us. The stars cursed me to the thousand rapes by the horn of Nightmare Moon, Zenith whispered next to me, shocking me nearly as much as the alicorn arrivals. You've been along Little Pip too long, Velva suggested, floating out her shotgun. The alicorns were already casting their shields. Welcome to the home of the goddess. The voice boomed in my head, reverberating with its own echoes. Oh, Velvet moaned, wavering. This is not good. Put away your puny weapons and come. You are my guests, for I, the goddess, have nothing to fear from you. Oh no. No, 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 no. If and she ain't got nothing to fear from us, why the show? Hell, why not just send us packing? Zenith looked between the three of us. What are you speaking of? But I knew. Oh, by the goddesses. The real ones. I knew. Heavily, I said. Because she wants us to do something for her. We were guided into a crumbling building. As we landed, we saw at least three dozen more alicorns standing about the crumbling ruins. In a single movement, in perfect unity, they all turned their heads to look at us. It was the unparalleled creepiness, creepiest thing in the history of ever. Escorted through the doors by the four midnight blue alicorns, they had dropped their shields. Honestly, they didn't need them. We were totally outmatched. I was surprised when the alicorns brought us to what looked like a security substation within the building. This room seemed largely undamaged, save by time. The rest of the rooms and hallways I had seen were broken and crumbling, fragmented by the subterranean blast, and eroded by centuries and weather. This small room was almost intact. There was no goddess here. There was nothing here but some chairs, a bank of four dusty monitors, and a microphone, a filing cabinet, and a few ridiculously pristine coffee cups. The area above the monitors was glass, but the long window looked out at nothing but a metal wall inches away. 
The opposite wall held a recessed door, and there were odd grooves on the wall. I reckon this is our sale, Calamity said. If so, it would be stifling and cramped if any of the alicorns tried to stay in here with us. We will talk, but first, the goddess wishes you to see, to understand, and marvel. The voice of the goddess didn't merely reverberate, I realized. It preverberated, like there were dozens of smaller, weaker voices inside that voice, all trying to say the same thing at the same time, but not quite succeeding. The voice of the goddess was a chorus. Understood what? The other remedy asked. Zenith looked at her, confused. The goddess! The security monitors flickered to life in the dust, one of them displaying colorful ponies and lab coats, milling about a much bigger version of the room, full of monitors and mainframes and banks of blinking lights. Ready when you are, a chartreuse pony with a cutie mark of a flask filled a bubbling green liquid, said, glancing up at the monitor. These images are of the past, Zenith intoned. The second monitor looked down on a vast factory floor. The factory was filled with six large, interconnected vats full of churning luminescent stews that rippled with lavender and green beneath glass coverings. The light casting colors showed over everything. Arcane apparatus hung down from the ceiling. Catwalks ringed the vats, and another hung suspended from the ceiling above and between them, stopping midway across the room in some matter of control panel at the end. Again with the catwalk over factory floors aesthetic of wartime equestria, I grossed. Is that? Velvet Remedy began to ask as a single pony appeared on the third monitor. An elderly lavender pony with a gray streak in her purple mane. The room behind her was about the size of this one, filled with identical monitoring equipment. But where we only saw a metal wall, her picture window looked out into a factory floor in monitor two. Twilight Sparkle, I nodded. Uh, your goddess, Nis? Calamity said to the air, tapping on the last monitor. I hope you're aware this one's broken. The monitor had a large crack running through it, and was displaying only rainbowed splotches. Broken? What? Uh, of course, I am. The goddess knows all. The little sub-voices continued to telepathically echo the last two words for uh, several seconds after the goddess had spoken. Lovely, Velvet Remedy said snidely. Ready to begin pony testing, Twilight Sparkle said, sounding just a hint nervous. Send her in. Sending in test subject one, the pony on the monitor announced. Don't call her that, Twilight warned. She trotted over to look out the window, floating a copy cuff filled with what looked like tea to her lips, sipping primly. She set the cup aside and leaned her muzzle over a microphone. On monitor two, a lovely blue unicorn with a mane that had aged to a luxurious silver slowly made her way out onto the suspended catwalk. She turned and looked up to the window. Twilight Sparkle, I just wanted to thank you again for giving me this opportunity. It means so much to me. You're welcome, Trixie, Twilight said kindly. The name rang a bell, but it took me a moment to place it. Trixie, the mayor from the cottage outside Fetlock. She went to Manhattan for a meeting with Twilight Sparkle, and never returned. The lavender pony hit a button with her hoof, and an ornate golden cup rose out of the console at the end of the catwalk. Purple and green liquids rose through tubes and began running from the vats of the apparatus above. Then a thin stream poured into the cup. Trixie walked across the platform and sniffed at the cup. 
Is that roses? Twilight chuckled softly. Yes, I added the scent. Hopefully it will taste like roses too. Really? Trixie looked up towards Twilight Sparkle with astonishment. Twilight's ears dropped. Unfortunately, probably not. She hesitated. Trixie, you know you don't have to do this. Oh, but I want to, the blue unicorn insisted. I want to help. And this will make me more powerful, like Luna and Celestia. Well, maybe not that powerful, but more powerful, yes. Like you then? Twilight Sparkle looked uncomfortable. We're hoping for more than that. And it's safe, right? Absolutely, said Twilight Sparkle, assuringly, to the blue unicorn on the catwalk below her. All the tests have come back looking spectacular. The only variable is, well, dosage. And for that, I need to do some testing with pony volunteers like you. With luck, we'll get it right the first time, and you'll be the first new alicorn since Luna was born. The unicorn looked up at the end of the catwalk and nodded, and mumbled something that sounded like, The great and powerful smells like roses. Then looked up with wide eyes. You sure I shouldn't start with more than that, then? Twilight Sparkle stifled, stifled a chuckle. No, I... On the monitors, everything happened at once. From the broken one, I could hear a terrible roar, and the rainbow sprays turned into a flaring light. On the other three, the world shook. On the first, chunks of ceiling came down, killing some ponies outright, one blocking the door. A mainframe toppled in a spray of sparks. A monitor two, the entire factory floor shook. I could hear the loud thwangs as several of the cables holding the suspended platform snapped out of the ceiling. Sections of catwalk fell. Two of the vats were ruptured as a third of the ceiling came down, spilling their glowing contents onto the factory floor. I could see automatic systems severing and sealing the connections with the other vats. Trixie cried out as half the cables holding her up her section of the catwalk gave way, turning it into a freely swinging platform. On the monitor, alarms were blaring. Radiation surge detected. Seismic activity detected. Toxic contamination warning. Safe rooms, ceiling. No! shouted Twilight Sparkle as a huge armored plate slid down over her door to her room. She turned to the window as massive armored shutters swung down from above. Trixie! A monitor two, Trixie's platform tipped, swinging in a low arc. The unicorn slid down the inclined surface trying to find purchase as the lower end of the catwalk segmented and impacted the glass roof of one of the vats, shattering it. The blue unicorn plunged into the vat. All of the monitors flickered and went dead. The four of us stood in the security room, shaken, our eyes peeling away from the monitors to look at each other. Monitor three flickered back on. Dear Anypony, this is the mayor of the Ministry of Magic, Twilight Sparkle. A week in Twilight said. It's been two days now since the Mega Spell Strike on Maripony. I can only assume, by the lack of rescue, that this was not an isolated strike. I'm leaving this recording in case some pony does come, but I'm trapped in a safe room, in safe room three, on the Maripony Vats level. The elderly lavender pony addressed the camera. The safeguards that should allow me to open it aren't working, and unfortunately for me, I designed these rooms to withstand a nearby mega spell strike, so the room is more than a match for my own magic. Calamity, Velvet Remedy, Zenith, and I watched the monitor, realizing we were watching Twilight Sparkle's goodbye letter. My vision began to blur wetly. I tried to force myself not to cry. I cried too much this week already. 
But these tears rolled down my cheeks. I'm out of food, and the safe room's water talisman seems to have been corrupted. She gave a weary smile as she said, At least I'm fairly confident that pure water isn't supposed to be that color. I'm also beginning to suffer hallucinations. I think I'm hearing the screams of the ponies in Maripony. Like, something horrible is happening to them. But, I know that's not possible. These walls are soundproof. I keep hearing Trixie's voice in my head. Screaming. Sometimes, it gets so bad. The lavender pony waved it off. Not important. The important thing is that we tried. We tried, and we came so very close. Another week, maybe even just a few more days, and the work we did here would have not only changed the war, I believe we could have even forged a peaceful resolution. What's important now is that we still have one more chance. Find Spike. He is my most loyal assistant. My number one assistant. Find him. Twilight Sparkle seemed to fall asleep. The monitor flickered out again. Spike? Zenith asked. The monitor burst back to life. Twilight Sparkle's haggard face was pressed close to the camera. She looked atrophic, crazed. Something's going on here. I... I don't know what, but it's bad. If you're in Maripony, get out. Get out while you can, and drop a zebra missile on this place. Suddenly, there was a loud, metallic grinding from the speaker monitor below. On the monitor, we watched as the metal plate of the door lifted up. The metal shutters over the windows lifted. Monitor 2 sprang to life. The vats room was a disaster. The floor was waist thick in mixed fluids. Something swam in the water. No, not swim. The body of a light red unicorn pony was being dragged through the liquid by a telekinetic tendril. We watched as the tendril hauled the body out of the pool and up the side of one of the bats. A moment later, the body disappeared over the lip and into the bat. Streaks of blood rose up out of several of the bats. On monitor 3, Twilight Sparkle was crawling towards the door, too weak from hunger and dehydration to stand. Unable to stand, she couldn't see what was just outside her window. Light flared into the room, a blue light that took the form of Trixie. The blue unicorn stood, shimmering, in front of Twilight Sparkle. From this angle, we could clearly make out her face as she spoke to the lavender unicorn, who had once bore the element of magic. The Trixie Unicorn, uh, Trixie Illusion spoke, but no words came out. I'm so sorry, Trixie, Twilight Sparkle whimpered. As the Trixie Illusion mouth continued to move, Zenith pushed past me and leaned close. Our zebra began to read the movement of the Illusion's mouth. To be sorry for, your experiment worked, after all. It worked more wonderfully than we have ever dreamed it would. Don't be sorry. Be happy. We're going to live forever, you and I. I felt a deep, dark chill, and prayed that Zenith had mistranslated that. What? asked a startled Twilight. I'm sorry it took so long for me to be strong enough to save you, Twilight Sparkle. Though it already gasped, as the light blue tendril of telekinesis energy snaked into the room and wrapped around each one of Twilight's hooves. No! Twilight's sparkle struggled with even more strength than should have been possible. It is time to save you now, Twilight Sparkle. Zenith continued to speak for Illusion Trixie. We're going to be very close now, you and I. Oh, goddesses, Velvet moaned and buried her face in Calamity's mane as the tendrils slowly dragged Twilight Sparkle, kicking and screaming, towards one of the bats. I was shaking. I wanted, so desperately, wanted, to turn away. 
but I couldn't. Twilight Sparkle let out a last cry as she was dragged over the lip of the furthest vat. One word. A name, I think. But I couldn't make out which one it was. My other two went blank. And this time, they stayed that way. Oh, goddesses. Oh, goddesses. Oh, goddesses. I felt utterly numb with horror. Velvet Remedy was crying. Calamity looked grimmer than ever. The whole room shook, the air filling with the squeal of grinding metal as the shutters over our own window lifted up. We stared out over the vats. This wasn't just a similar room. It was the same room. Centuries had not been kind to the room beyond. Another third of the ceiling had collapsed, as had two of the vats. The pool on the floor had been turned to sludge covered with a sickly layer of dust and floating debris. Swirls of color light seeped through the two still intact vats. They dashed in the air, exploding like fireworks. In my head, I heard the echoes and half-remembered fanfare to not from any memory orb of my own. The great and powerful goddess welcomes you. Okay, how in tarnation do we kill that? Calamity, I hissed. More swirls of light lifted from the vat. They shimmered, merging together, until the giant face of Trixie loomed above us. But not just Trixie. As little motes of other ponies' faces occasionally burst to the surface like zits, crawling along the head and mane of Trixie before sinking back. Fear not, for I, the goddess, already know why you have come. Red Eye, that treacherous pony, desires my end. But the goddess is not worried, for the goddess is great and powerful, and Red Eye is not. Somehow, through the sheer soul-breaking horror of what I was seeing and what I had just witnessed, the little pony in my head stomped for me to pay attention. She did not like where this was heading. Fear not, Zenith began, for I, the goddess, already... You can stop that now, Velvet Remedy hissed. Yet. I squeaked. Then, to find my voice. Red Eye has seen these recordings, hasn't he? It matters not that he has seen them. That would be a yes. It matters that he has disobeyed me and plotted against me. It matters that he has been withholding from me. Red Eye has not sent me a unicorn in over a year, and the goddess believes he will soon stand in the way of my unity altogether. And, let me guess. I prodded. You need us to kill Red Eye for you. Please let it not be something as stupid as that. There won't be enough face hoofs in the world. The illusionary fire were changed. A spinning pinwheel of crimson flame swirled behind the floating glower of the goddess, over-signaling her displeasure. Ugh, Velvet Remedy whispered, cringing back. Even for a real goddess, this would seem a bit much. She neighed. Honestly, if we must have an eldritch nightmare of arcane science goddess, why does she have to be a freaky carnival sideshow goddess, too? Do not be absurd. The goddess can slay him at any time I choose, but... And here it comes. It is possible that he has discovered something that might be a threat to the new, glorious world we are building. And before the goddess destroys him, we, I, must know what it is. Well, okay. That makes a lot more sense. Says the goddess who just claimed to know all not 20 minutes ago. Velvet Remedy muttered. Clement and Nutshire with a wing. Would you kindly not upset the telepathic psycho gazalt? And why us? Because the secret that Red Eye seeks, the secret hidden from the great and powerful goddess, is locked away inside the ministry on Warehouse Walk, in Canterlot. 
Oh. So that's the place Red Eye is trying to get into. I remember the conversation with Watcher. Yes. One of Equestria's heroes did decide that her ministry would be the Ministry of Awesome. They even have a ministry headquarters for it on Ministry Walk. After a few years, Luna ordered it crated up, and they began using the MAW HQ for storage. With controls which can only be operated by a Pegasus. Clever. So, the goddess didn't actually need me. She needed Calamity. I wondered now how Red Eye was planning to get past that. And beyond a shield, which only a Ministry Mayor can step through. And that would be the bypass that Red Eye was trying to get through. But why did... Oh, of course. Close family or direct descendant thereof. The goddess needed to develop remedy as well. Once again, I was the one just clearing the way. In addition, there is one thing remaining that prevents unity. A flaw in the process that must be corrected before it can be brought to every pony in this blighted land. You know, now that I've seen what this unity is about, I'm fine with that. That's because you are only a pony. Your kind cannot thrive in this world any longer. You're, you merely survive, and barely at that. But my children can thrive. My children are more powerful, more capable of facing the mutated dangers of this world. The very poisons which kill you make my children stronger. Your children can't even breed, I pointed out. Every single alicorn I've seen is a mare. You have no stallions. Now I'll agree that can be fun, but when it comes to thriving, that's a doozy of a problem. The main voice of the goddess was silent for a moment. Flares and fireworks continued to explode behind her glowing, faces covered face. They whispered incoherently in my mind, giving me a headache. Like the goddess said, a flaw, but one which can be corrected with the right magic. Let me guess, you want Rarity's little black book. The goddess didn't need me, or did need me after all. She needed some pony who could pick a lock. As our alicorn escorts marched us back to the Sky Bandit, all my friends were wondering the same thing I was. What now? Can you all read lips? Zenith asked. Okay, so not all my friends were wondering the same thing. Red Eye still had me over a barrel, but I stopped like I had been hit in the face with a bale of hay. I lost all feeling in my hooves as one more horrid realization floated through me. Little Pip? Calamity asked. Something in my expression was making him look very worried. She said, Red Eye hadn't sent her any unicorns for over a year. Her mind flacked back to experience of the slavers, and the little hints that Red Eye, or at least CERN, was particularly interested in unicorns. And another unicorn, too. She'll fetch a pretty price, this one. If it wasn't a unicorn, I'd say toss it back in the lake. But if Red Eye wasn't sending unicorns to the goddess, I said darkly, then he's keeping them for himself. I turned and looked at the others in desperation. Red Eye talked about controlling the weather, moving the sun and the moon. He couldn't do that if he just became an alicorn. But he's not aiming to become an alicorn. He's aiming to become one of... of... I pointed a hoof back at Mariponi. That! The only way he could possibly hope to get that kind of power was to duplicate what happened to Trixie. And he could. I'd seen the videos, and so had he. And based on his claim that the fortress in the Everfree Forest was designed as a new home for the goddess, he was building a duplicate of the Merit Pony, Vats, and the Cathedral. He wasn't sending the goddess any unicorns, because unicorns have the strongest magic of all ponies, and he was keeping them to consume himself. 
Footnote. Maximum level. Skills note. Stealth has reached 100%. New perk. Celestia Tier Telekinesis. The things you can do with your levitation magic are the feats of legend. You can effectively fly at the skill level of Novice Pegasus. Who knows? Maybe you could even move the sun.